What's up, everybody? We are back. John Della Rose here, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. I've been doing kind of a lot of analysis on the comic industry as of lately. I've kind of just tried to figure out where things changed, where things went wrong, where the industry switched its business model from attempting to really capture everybody and to capture young readers at a young age to continue reading versus shifting up the age level of their content in order to maintain an aging audience. And I think that's at the heart of where comics has struggled over the last 30 years. I think our change from the comics code, the um, darkening of all the stories, the making everything edgy and more violent and more sexualized has created a culture where there's very few people who are actually interested in consuming that sort of product. It's really pushed towards targeting um, a smaller and smaller demographic of people. And I, I keep wondering where this changed. And I've written articles for, for different outlets about you know, Alan Moore and it's Neil Gaiman and Frank Miller really, really pushed comics over the top into, into something different to where they really were trying to deconstruct the genre and change it into uh, something a lot more serious than it actually was um, in order to, I guess, satisfy their literary thoughts. And uh, the 90s is really an easy point to target when you kind of look at that, I mean, you really see the big changes in the nineties. Uh, you know, you look at, you look at what image comics did and, and uh, then Marvel's reaction with heroes reborn where they really tried to modernize all their characters and change the concepts from, you know, I mean, if you look at the fantastic four, it's silly. It's a guy who sets on fire. It's, it's a big rock monster. It's a stretchy dude and, uh, and an invisible hot chick. That's it. I mean, it's, it's pretty, Pretty, uh, pretty simplistic stuff. Um, and a lot of those concepts, you know, of course, The Invisible Woman, it comes from The Invisible Man, which was a, a sci-fi novel. Uh, the Human Torch actually comes from a different Human Torch. Uh, Mr. Fantastic comes from Plastic Man. And a big rock monster is, uh, is nothing new in comics, too. So those were all concepts that have been done a lot of times. And they just put them together and mashed them up and had a lot of fun with them. And I've noticed that when I see concepts like that, I really like it. I noticed with Valiant Comics, uh, with especially like Exo Man War, you know, you got an alien invasion, you got the Conan vibe because it's a it's a guy from the Visigoth era, you know, in an alien Iron Man armor spacesuit, you know, that's you know beating everybody up. It, it's just those concepts shoved together are just kind of a lot of fun, and there's nothing super serious about them. There's nothing literary about that. There's nothing. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? I think literary actually does cover it. But uh, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm reading a, a book called Speedball, The Mask Marvel right now, which is why you might wonder why I have this cover up on the screen. And I've, I've actually got the physical book, so I can't put up uh, what, I'm, what I'm reading here. But um, what's pretty neat about the collection of this book, which is by Steve Ditko, um, and it's from 1987. So it, it's kind of right before the big, big transitions in comics. Uh, you know, you're, you're still getting panel work that is, you know, has a lot of white gutter space that has um, that that sort of classic comic book look and layout to it. But uh, the tone of things are starting to change in the 80s. And I'm reading some of these letters and I'm starting to see, OK, this is really where the, the industry is switching over and and making that migration. And it's very interesting uh, how some of the readers react. I'm going to read a couple portions of letters here. This one is from Russell Smith. I don't know anything about him, but they used to print names and addresses, if you can believe that. Can you, can you imagine somebody doing that in 2020? Anyway, um, the story is innocent and clear. So far, it seems clean of the, un of the usual complex subplots in today's, and he does this in scare quotes, quote, hip writers build into their stories. This book has the same simple, straightforward style of the famed Lee, he means Stanley, Chronicles, and only updated to today's pace. 
This tradition has carried on with the thoughtful plotting of Steve Ditko and Tom DeFalco. I trust that these two will pursue the possibilities of Robert's powers. Robert, Roger, Stern's, ugh, Roger Stern's scripting captured the confusion a teen often feels. The art is beautiful. It is vintage Ditko, reminding me of that feeling I was living in the mid-60s. Uh, very cool. And yes, this book so far, I'm going to review it later. So I'll, I'll do a full review where I kind of scan the pages and all that. Um, but uh notice notice just like the the uh, joy of reading a simplistic comic that that has a hero that's a clear hero that has a villain that's a a clear villain ditko really wanted to present that and he thought even since the late 60s that comics was losing its way in that regard and he created a character called mr a who is very over the top in in trying to get his message across of what he thinks comics should be but Speedball pre presents a little bit of that, too. Um, you have a very similar situation, interestingly, to Spider-Man uh, in the setup of Speedball. You have a kid who is in a lab accident, right? Uh, just like just like Peter Parker was. And the kid has drama with his parents uh, or, you know, like Uncle Ben with that that propels him into action. Now, notice Spider-Man actually, as a character, didn't do the right thing at first, and his guilt kept his action later. Speedball's difference uh, from just a moral span standpoint is that uh, he's going to leap into action right away, and he's, he's going to be the hero because he's got that hero mentality. And I think that hero mentality is where comics of this era really start to change. And um, you see it in a couple of the uh, other letters comments here. Um, let's see. see uh, what, uh, let's see. After reading a premiere issue of Speedball, there isn't too much more to say other than Steve Ditko. This is a Steve Ditko comic. The thing is, this is a double edged sword. One edge is with the Steve Ditko comic has over others is, is isn't going to get too heavy, which is a very important part of comics. Comics have gotten so heavy these days. Uh, even more now, in the, and now that it's 2020, than it, than it was in the 80s. I mean, the amount of seriousness and darkness and and all that. And just look at the, how the Speedball character changed. I mean, you look at Civil War and how Speedball just jumped around and caused an accident and just like, you know, ruined his and other heroes' lives, uh, like in a almost um, a school shooting style incident. I mean, it was just it was just ugly. That stuff's heavy and it's not fun. Um, so there you go. It carries a light zippy style uh, that is easily seen in the artwork. There is a good and evil, which is another important part of a good story, with a concentrated dose of bizarre and different things added to everyday life. The masks used by the crooks in the second half are much in the disco style that a few other artists could draw them well. The other cutting edge, and here's where people's 80s and tastes start to change because the because the people who are reading are starting to get older and starting to want uh, more complexity of their stuff. The things get too simplistic. It doesn't matter if Tom Vincent colors and the various panels of the story because the story goes for straight black and white characters. There should be someone to get shaded gray, light gray, for example. And so um, this guy's trying to rewrite Steve Ditko's stories. And Steve Ditko is very adamant that he doesn't like these shades of gray. And he's been that way since the 1960s. Um, he thinks that stories should serve a function and that that function for stories is to uh, have some clear moral purpose for people. And traditionally, that's very much the case. Um, stories uh, resonate over time because we see that good versus evil and we say, OK, this is this is what we want and this is what we want to applaud. When you when you lose that, when you, get, you when you're pushing into, you know, the Punisher, or you're pushing into. Um, all these anti-heroes of the 80s and 90s, like look at Venom for a real example of that. Jeez, you know, those stories become very forgettable very quickly because they don't have much truth to them. They just have violence for the sake of violence, uh, you know, sex for the sake of sex. And those sorts of things do muddy the water of storytelling. And you can see it starting here where the audience is starting to call for that because it is when you see it, when you watch that, it is much more shocking it does hold your attention in the moment a lot more because it can go over the top a lot more, but it fades quickly because it, it's just something that doesn't resonate uh, over time. 
And that's what Steve Ditko is trying to prevent in his comics. And in Speedball here, he definitely does that. His his character, um, unlike Spider-Man, who, you know, kind of is forced to compel into action, he he makes a lot, a uh, lot of a lot of mistakes and a lot of um bad choices uh within even in his early adventures. Um Ditko didn't like that. And part of why Ditko quit Marvel Comics was because Stan Lee wanted to push the envelope in that direction uh, because it got a lot of hate praise right away. But Steve Ditko really wanted uh, a character that was going to do the right thing. If a, if a hero is going to be a hero, he should be a hero. And that was his thought. Um, and Speedball really exemplifies that. So uh, this kid really tries to be a hero in every situation, always tries to do right. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting to watch how people react to that both positively and negatively. Now, um, I, I think uh, watching this and watching this era, this book didn't sell um, and it was canceled pretty quick. But you got to see kind of a last gasp for pure comics here and for uh, good storytelling that really uh, has some value, can be family friendly uh, and doesn't, doesn't uh, succumb to too many modern temptations. And this is where I think the industry really started to change. Uh, if you look at uh, this era, this is uh, this is the beginnings of it. It really peaked in like 1994, I think, and uh, and then it's been on its huge decline, rapid decline ever since. Uh, all these things, plus there's the, of course the business factors that went on, but this, uh, you know, and and the push to change comics into something serious and literary, and serious and dark, and serious and edgy. Um, is really where comics lost most children. And so you lost the next generation of readers. And uh, you can see it, you know, just in the numbers today. Comics went from selling in the millions to now selling in the thousands. And uh, it's it's sad. I, I, I get sad when I read this. I get sad when I see some of the reactions trying to push Ditko in a different direction from what he wants artistically. Um and uh, this is a, a beautiful book and a beautiful throwback uh, to, you know, what could have been if uh, if comics really just kept its path and kept uh, trying to be something that's for everybody and uh, not just for, you know, some aging middle aged men who want some something, some intense action that they can get in any other media form. It's very, uh, very, very. This is the point where comics changed. Oh, well, that's it. That's my analysis. Uh, that's my retrospective of this letters column. This is from Speedball number six. Uh, this was the first letters column uh, in the book. And uh, it's very interesting reading these old letters columns and just seeing reactions of fans and readers and all that. If you like this and you like my comic analysis, please hit that like and subscribe button. And of course, um, I have a comic book out myself. It's called Robotoad Wrecked Manlet. And, you know, it's, it's of course, mocking the wrecked manlets that uh, really want this edgy boy uh, fiction on the on the campaign. Um, I'm going to pull up the uh, pull this up right now. Yes, I'm in my closet for people who just saw me there. I'm in my closet because uh, one, it provides a nice little sound box, and two, uh, the kids get really loud. <laughs> so <laughs> I try to uh, I try to just uh, keep keep the background noise to a minimum here when I'm recording. Um. All right, so uh, this is my campaign. Yes, the, yes, this is a joke uh, on the campaign, but it is not a joke in the comic book. If you like this Steve Ditko sort of suspense that I'm talking about in the video, um, this is going to be for you. It's a classic monster story with a classic lesson that the, the protagonist has to learn. There's the classic damsel in distress element. I really went for uh, really telling a classic comic. And if you are into that, you're going to enjoy this. So please pick it up. Please support the channel and my efforts here in culture. And I will talk to you soon.